We have in the previous lesson calculated this M3 profile. The channel is 1200 meter long and we determined that the water profile reaches the critical depth after a distance of 932 meter. So how can the flow continue? In particular, if we consider that this channel is connected to a reservoir as at its downstream end, with, for example, a water depth of 5 meter, so a depth above HU, how can the flow continue? We have explained before that the supercritical flow profile, such as the M3 profile here, does not depend on the downstream conditions, as the information cannot travel back in the upstream direction. So there is obviously a conflict between the upstream supercritical flow with our M3 profile and the downstream conditions with a water depth, for example, of 5 meter. Such a conflict is solved by a hydraulic jump. As indicated by its name, it consists of a jump in water elevation, that is a significant elevation of the water level on a rather short distance. As we can see here, the hydraulic jump presents as its upstream end a fast bottom jet below a recirculating flow area with rollers and braking waves. Progressively, after a certain distance, that is the length of the hydraulic jump, the bottom jet extends over the whole downstream water depth. This process induces significant energy dissipation, as we will see later. So in this lesson, we will first characterize the different types of hydraulic jumps and then develop the equations linking the upstream and downstream water depths and velocities across a hydraulic jump. In a hydraulic jump, as sketched here, we have the incoming flow with a water depth H1, a cross section A1 and a velocity V1. With these values, we can calculate the food number of the incoming flow. We will show later that the incoming flow is always supercritical, so this food number F, FR1 will always be larger than 1. So let us denote by L1 the length of the hydraulic jump, and we can see it, it here also on the movie, we see this finite length of the jump. Experimental measurements performed at the USBR show that the length of the hydraulic jump is about six times the downstream water depth H2. So at the scale of a river, with water depths of about 5 meters, for example, the length of the hydraulic jump would be about 30 meters, which can be considered as negligible compared to the length of a river reach, that is often uh, several kilometers. Therefore, the hydraulic jump will usually be represented as a sharp transition, as we will see when deriving the equations. So the incoming food number is also used to classify the different types of hydraulic jumps. For food numbers close to 1, we have an underlar jump that presents undul undulations of the free surface. Such a flow is close to the critical conditions. And we have seen that critical flows are usually unstable, as near the critical depth, the specific energy does not vary much in comparison with the water depth. This explains the oscillations of the free surface around the critical depth. For this category here of hood numbers, smaller rollers appear, but the downstream free surface is only weakly affected. This is the weak jump. Then, for food numbers up to 4.5, we can observe an oscillating bottom jet, sometimes directed towards the free surface, sometimes towards the bed. These oscillations induce free surface waves with low energy dissipation that can induce damages in the downstream areas, sometimes even far from the jump location. Such an oscillating jump should thus be avoided. For this range of inflow food numbers, we have the stable jumps, so 4.5 to 9. 
the end of the surface rollers coincide with the point where the bottom jet leaves the region close to the bed. The hydraulic jump is considered as stable and it is the ideal configuration to dissipate energy without inducing downstream damages, as we will see later. Finally, for fruit numbers larger than 9, we have the strong jump in which the rollers interact with the bottom jet, which induces important waves in the downstream direction. Of course, all these limits are indicative. These also depend on the shape of the cross section and on the local conditions. As explained earlier, a hydraulic jump extends in the reality over a certain length. But to write the equations, it will be represented as a sharp discontinuity as in this illustration. We will assume a prismatic, almost horizontal channel, which means that we will neglect the contribution of the weight parallel to the bed in the balance of forces. We will also neglect the friction losses, because these will be much smaller than the actual head losses occurring in the hydraulic jump. The flow is considered as parallel, upstream and downstream from the jump, so, we will choose a control volume according to this assumption, like here, for example. Finally, we will assume that the velocity distribution in these upstream and downstream sections is uniform, in such a way that the non-uniformity coefficients alpha and beta will be considered equal to 1. We write the Euler equation of momentum on a control volume encompassing the water level discontinuity, so the volume A, B, D, C, with a parallel flow upstream here and downstream. And we will project the equation along the direction parallel to the bed. The forces to be considered are the component of the gravity in the flow direction, the friction and the hydrostatic pressure forces. The two first forces are neglected considering our assumptions, so we only have to determine the hydrostatic pressure forces. The hydrostatic pressure force is by definition the pressure at the center of gravity of the cross section G here multiplied by the area of the cross section, as indicated here for section 1. We can link the depth of the center of gravity Zg here, measured along the vertical of the, to the depth Hg, measured perpendicular to the bed, using this relation here. In the same way, we can write the force on section 2, with a minus sign as this force is directed in the upstream direction. The momentum balance is the difference of momentum between the volumes A, B, D, C and A prime, B prime, C prime, and C prime. So uh, this can also be written like this as the difference of momentum between these two volumes. Finally, the momentum balance in equation 3 can be expressed like this where the quantities be between square brackets here are the mass of this volume and of this volume respectively. Combining equations 2 and 3, the Euler equation 1 can be written as in equation 4 here. Then, dividing the equ this equation by rho g delta t, and replacing the velocity by q over a, we finally obtain equation 5. So let us now analyze this equation. We see that this equation expresses the conservation of a quantity across the hydraulic jump. This quantity is the specific force that can be expressed in terms of zg or in terms of the depth hg the, so the depth of the center of gravity of the cross section projected onto the vertical, that's in this case here. To analyze this function now, 
it will be more convenient to write it like this by dividing by the square root of 1 minus s0 square. Under this form, the specific force can be represented as a function of the water depth as illustrated here by the blue curve, by this curve here. We can see that this function tends to infinity when the depth approaches zero, so here, but also when the depth approaches infinity. And in this case, the asymptote has a parabolic shape, as the water depth appears both in term A and in HG. So F will tend um, to infinity like a function of H square. We also see that this curve presents a minimum that corresponds to a zero value of the derivative of the specific force function with respect to h. In this first term, we know that dA dH is equal to L, which is the width of the cross section as the, at the free surface. Then the second term can be calculated as the difference of static moment between two sections with a depth difference of delta H, assuming that the area dA, so this here, can be considered as a rectangle of area L dH. So the term highlighted in red here can be developed like this and neglecting the small terms of the second order, we finally see that the derivative of the static moment is simply the wetted area A. Combining the different results we just obtained, we finally get this equation that we already met before. It defines the critical depth, so the minimum specific force occurs for the critical depth. We have shown that the specific force is conserved across a hydraulic jump. The two water depths H1 and H2 in the equation, so and illustrated here, are called the sequent depths. These are situated on either side of HC. H1 is below HC, while H2 is above HC. This indicates that the hydraulic jump makes the link between a supercritical flow and a subcritical flow. So in this lesson, we have described the hydraulic jump and defined the concept of specific force. In the next lesson, we will see how to calculate different quantities related to hydraulic jumps. Goodbye!